Okay, it looks like it's top of the hour. Thank you everyone for joining us today for this webinar. Just a few things before we get started. Um, the chat function is where you can submit your questions for the question and answer session at the end of the webinar. Certificates will be available this Friday by logging into your account. And one other quick thing before we get started, we're excited to announce the registration is now open for Medela's first ever virtual 15th annual uh, symposium. And you can go to medelaeducation.com and click on the banner to learn more about that and to register. And just a quick note um, for researchers and clinicians that are interested in um, submitting a post or abstract. The deadline for those is July 31st, which is coming up pretty quick. So um, go ahead and visit medelaeducation.com for more information on that. Danielle, if you're ready to get started, go right ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so today we are going to talk about nipple shields and creating a supportive approach to using nipple shields in your practice. So a little bit about me, I am a nurse, a, a lactation consultant, and have been a nurse for about 17 years um, and have now recertified by test um, a few years ago uh, for lactation. And um, my entire career essentially has been at Evergreen Health, which is in the Puget Sound area in Washington State. And um, I work in the, in the family maternity unit, seeing patients while they're inpatient for the first two to three days. After delivery, I work in a postpartum breastfeeding center. So we routinely see all discharges at day two after discharge. So they're generally between three and five days old, the babies are. Um, and we also then see breastfeeding follow-ups as far as even years out. Um, it's of note that Evergreen Health was the first baby friendly hospital in North America. And um, it's pretty cool when sometimes when we go to like an ILCO conference, it's like, ooh, you work at Evergreen. We're kind of renowned for that. And that is really neat. If you recognize my voice, it may be because um, you've taken uh, modules from the Evergreen Perinatal Education. I am on faculty and develop modules for them as well. So I'm really excited to be here today. It's nice to uh, get back to teaching after a bit of a, a lull there with COVID. And even though we're not in the same space, it's nice to, to be here. Okay, so our object objectives today is to talk about appropriate situations, possible impacts when we introduce a nipple shield for mom and baby, and then to really focus on how do we support moms um, with good education and follow up. And really my goal always when I'm working with parents and when I'm teaching is to help parents feel confident in their breastfeeding abilities. Um, and you'll notice that kind of peppered throughout the talk and, and really any talk uh, I give, no matter the topic, is really we're, we're trying to help parents feel confident. Okay, so let's look at these funny nipple shields. Um, nipple shields have been in written recorded history for at least 500 years, um, and they've been made from all kinds of things. Uh, the wood one, I think, is quite interesting. Glass makes me a little nervous. Um, you can even see bone, that one in the, in the top picture to the right. Um, and, and really, it's not surprising to me when we think about um, that breastfeeding is a very important uh, piece of our species. Of course, uh, we were going to try to uh, develop things that would help mothers along the way. You can also see um, a little bit newer in the 19th century, we had um, a cluster of babies who actually died of lead poisoning. Didn't know that nipple shields made of lead were not such a good idea. So that wasn't good, but commonly um, nipple shields were used to prevent sore nipples or help baby latch on. And then came the more um, recent 20th century. These nipple shields were often made out of rubber or latex and they were very thick. We all know um, in the world of lactation that nipple shields can be a flashpoint, right? It, it sometimes evokes strong emotion around whether you use nipple shields, recommend nipple shields in your practice or not. And some of that comes from these old school uh, 
nipple shields. They were made out of really thick rubber, and we just kind of have to go back to thinking about our hormone pathways to realize why those thick nipple shields would not have been good for a mom's milk supply. When the baby latches on, it's that tactile stimulation on the mom's breast and nipple with the baby's cheeks, mouth, nose, chin, hands, that help stimulate the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland to release the milk hormones, oxytocin and prolactin. So um, really well researched to say that these thick uh, latex or rubber nipple shields can greatly reduce milk supply. So we know those ones, not so good. But then what we were all, all more uh, familiar with certainly is the thin silicone um, uh, nipple shields, which are common now. I, I always think it's interesting when we see the contact nipple shield like this, often uh, families think that that cutout is really to help it not touch baby's nose because they're definitely worried about that. Um, but really, I love to explain to them, it's actually to provide more contact with the baby's skin and mom's uh, breast. And again, that's a great time to be able to explain why that tactile stimulation of baby's cheeks, nose, chin, hands, all those things help with that hormone pathway and help milk flow and help develop her milk supply. So that's a, a great kind of teaching moment when, when we talk about the reason for that cutout or contact nipple shield. So let's look a little bit at the research. So there was in, in 1996, the entire Journal of Human Lactation, every article in it, was devoted to nipple, nipple shields, either new research or research reviews, opinion papers, things like that. Um, and so it's really interesting to go back and, and read this um, article. Some things have changed, but a lot really hasn't changed. And, uh, and kind of the overall arching thought from the, that entire journal devoted to nipple shields was that um, because of the improvements in technology, there is a more positive attitude towards nipple shield use. But it's really important that there is good follow up with nipple shields. Then we have a few literature reviews to uh, look to. One was in the Journal of Breastfeeding Medicine in 2010. One was in Frontiers in Public Health just six years ago in 2015. And both of these uh, literature reviews included 13 to 14 studies. Some were the same in both literature reviews, some were different. And they focused, their, their inclusion criteria was really the physiological responses, Premature infants, there was three or four um, studies in each review included on premature infants specifically. They also included mother's experiences and the 2015 literature review included healthcare provider experiences. Things they looked at was milk transfer. There are pre and post weights affected by using milk uh, nipple shields. Uh, they looked at hormone levels like prolactin and cortisol to be able to see if that's affected by nipple shields. They looked at infant suck. They looked at how long a mother breastfed for and how mothers felt about using the nipple shield. Now, as you know, if you read lactation research, it's really hard to get a really good research study. We're not gonna have double blind um, prospective studies mostly. And so th these were the challenges addressed by the literature reviewers, uh, that there was challenges with having a lack of mixed um, studies and prospective studies, large studies, they were all um, relatively small. One of the other interesting thing, which always irks me a little bit when it comes to lactation research, is that there often wasn't good defined definitions of what breastfeeding was. For example, if they they may have included um, breastfeeding a, a mom breastfeeding in the research and the results if she was also giving formula. Um, so you know having some consistent definitions were did not happen across the board, which made comparing these um, these studies difficult. But in the end, um, what both uh, research reviews came up with was that really, if a nipple shield is introduced. Uh, that family should be followed by a healthcare profession professional to help them transition away from the nipple shield when they're ready, to keep an eye on the baby's weight gain and mom's milk supply. And I really like when the conclusion statement from the 2015 um, literature review that says when tools are initiated, not just nipple shield, when lactation tools are initiated, uh, we need to make sure that we're assessing, is it working? 
Is it really solving the problem? And are the mom and baby satisfied and comfortable? So I think that's true, a really balanced, supportive approach to all uh, lactation tools. Then there was a research study just earlier this year in March uh, that included 59 dyads and they compared milk transfer from in moms that were not having pain and not using a nipple shield compared to moms that were using a nipple shield because they were having nipple pain. This one stood out to me a little bit because often in some of the other um, research studies, they included different reasons for using the nipple shield. So maybe, um, you know, uh, smooth nipples or infant related reasons. So it's a little hard to kind of suss things out. This one only included mothers using a nipple shield because of pain. And so that I thought was was different than of this study than ones I'd seen before. And uh, what they found was that the milk transfer and impact on milk production was not affected when moms used nipple shield or not, and pain was improved in the pain group. So moms that already started in pain were improved by using the nipple shield. Some of the limitations of that study was they didn't talk a lot about the length of time that they used the nipple shield and how long they went on to breastfeed for. So again, a limitation. So now that we know kind of some of the research background, why often are nipple shields introduced? Why do we um, sometimes introduce them as a tool in our practice? Um, remember, of course, that breastfeeding is a duet. And so sometimes there's more nipple or breast related reasons, and sometimes the reasons are more baby related. Sometimes they're both. Um, certainly from an anatomical perspective, moms with smoother nipples, inverted or, or large nipples um, can sometimes benefit from a nipple shield. At times, it's more the breast tissue. Uh, so sometimes baby goes from latching beautifully on the first couple days, baby's able to pull that nipple tissue deeply into their mouth, and then mom's milk comes in. And a soft, compressible, stretchy breast and tissue went for to being a basketball super hard and firm, and now baby is just kind of slipping off, either getting to the tip of the nipple and causing mom pain, or uh, baby's just not able to sustain the latch. Sometimes a nipple shield can be helpful for that reason if we're not able to get the breast softened. And then of course, sometimes nipple shields are used as a barrier um, for sore nipples. Some of the baby related reasons we might um, encounter for introducing a nipple shield would be the preterm and early baby. Um, sometimes the baby that has a disorganized um, suck uh, can help them kind of coordinate. It can give them that tactile stimulation to coordinate their suck. Sometimes if they have problematic oral anatomy, such as ankyloglossia, a high palate, things like that. Sometimes the baby with low tone. Um, and then sometimes nipple shields are used as a transition if a baby has a bottle preference. Uh, and this may be a reason that we introduce the shield a little bit down the road, um, potentially even if the baby is um, really liking the bottle, fussy at the breast, maybe a nipple shield is a little bit more familiar of a um, tactile uh, stimulation there, and sometimes it can be used in that way. And I'm sure we could think of other reasons that we've introduced it. So let's kind of think pros and cons. Um, it's interesting to me because I feel like on I could have made this slide a scale, right? Sometimes what is a pro for one mom is a con for another and vice versa. Um, certainly we have to be aware of the p possibility of affecting milk transfer or supply. When, for example, I am have a, see a family in the breastfeeding center for a nipple shield weaning appointment. They're ready to wean from the nipple shield. Let's see. We're going to measure that before and after weight with and without the nipple shield. How does baby do? Sometimes babies are improved their transfer with the nipple shield, and then potentially the nipple shield improves supply because we're removing milk. Potentially, the nipple shield is acting as a barrier between that hormone pathway and potentially if baby doesn't transfer as much milk, then milk supply can suffer. So again, both sides uh, of the scale there. Um, and same then would go for infant weight loss. If the milk supply is decreasing, then is the baby gaining weight? On the other hand, if mom's, uh, if the transfer is improved with the nipple shield, potentially um, babies could have improved weight gain. Um, one that I do think is important is the delayed diagnosis of infant suck problems. 
the the times when I really want to do a good assessment, always, but especially is when the nipple shield was in, introduced very early. If a nipple shield was introduced early, have we really gotten to the root cause or the root reason of why the nipple shield was introduced? And if we do an oral suck assessment, if that's in your scope and in your practice, then um, and we find that there is a suck issue, is the that initial milk supply that often is you know comes in robustly masking some other issues that over time can lead to delayed um, low milk supply even down the road. So if we're using a nipple shield, we really want to know why. Why are we using it? Um, sometimes moms dislike using the nipple shield. Again, the other side of the coin, sometimes they love it. If she's really sore and we introduce a nipple shield and it improves comfort, oh my gosh, her confidence can go way up. On the other hand, um, for some moms, if they are feeling like, you know, see, my breasts weren't good enough, I had to use this thing. So how we approach that and support mothers is important. And my absolute favorite lactation researcher, Cindy Lee Dennis, she is out of the um, out of Canada, the Toronto area, I believe. And she does research specifically on how mom's self-efficacy or their own confidence um, affects their ability to reach their own breastfeeding goals. And her research is beautifully done. I really love it. And um, she has found that about 27% of moms with low confidence discontinued breastfeeding in the first week, in the first week, compared to moms who felt like, I'm going to do this, I've got this, only 5%. So that shows you that, you know, either group may have experienced sore nipples, either group may have had smooth nipples or engorgement, but if they believed they could do it, they were more likely to do it. Um, so, however, what a mom is feeling about this tool, that's one of our goals is that we are helping um, her build her confidence. Um, some of the other possible effects is that um, it can decrease maternal stress potentially. If she's really struggling with having sore nipples and um, or latch struggles, maybe the nipple shield really um, helps calm things down and get more um, comfort for her. Um, potentially for those preterm babies, if they're not able to latch without the shield, that may give them that experience sooner. Um, so, you know, again, we could have this scale on the screen, right? Sometimes what works for one mother doesn't work for another and vice versa. So really all of those slides can kind of be summed up in, in this one. We, again, nipple shields can be a flashpoint. And uh, one of the reasons is because of the history when nipples were really, really thick, Yep, they decrease supply, and therefore there's certainly some lactation um, specialists out there who, who might say, no, I never use a nipple shield because they're coming from this place. Then nipple shields were made of thin silicone. Then the idea was, well, they're always fine. There's no consequences to, to using nipple shields. I actually work with a, a nurse who worked in a um, hospital in the Midwest who said in the little OB, um, like, welcome to the hospital. Here's your pregnancy um, kit. So this was her first OB appointment, potentially. And she got a little receiving blanket. She got some breast pads and she got a nipple shield. Well, no, that's the other end of this pendulum, right? So where is our middle ground? How do we use nipple shields as in the appropriate tool that they are? And what we're going to do is create a nipple shield game plan. So our game plan is going to be that we're really going to work to correct underlying latch, suck, anatomy issues to ensure that the, we've got the right tool, that the nipple shield is appropriate in this dyad's case. We're going to avoid some of the always and never and nipple shield pitfalls, and we're going to um, work to provide good education and have a good plan for follow-up when we do introduce a nipple shield. So when we first think about why one of the reasons the nipple shields are, are sometimes introduced is maternal anatomy. So let's start. What is a normal nipple? I, I think this little photo is interesting in that it has three options. You either have a normal nipple, you have a flat nipple, or you have an inverted nipple. This is one of those times I wish we were all in the same room because if I, I think we would hear chuckles, right? <laughs> We would hear chuckles around, yeah, but there's about a million other options between that on what anatomy looks like. 
Nipples can be rounded, everted, large, small, absent, uh, large at the tip and very narrow at the base. They can be folded over. They can be very long, bifurcated, bulbous, dimpled, doubled, um, slanted, sloped. We could think of all kind of adjectives to describe nipples. And babies don't need to have necessarily this picture of the normal nipple. Um, don't have to have that that nipple tissue in order to latch. Babies can latch on lots of different types of nipples. And um, so I think it's important to remember that there really isn't a normal. It's it's efficiency. What can this baby do? The other piece is that um, it the nipple is connected to the breast tissue. And so sometimes a, a nipple that has a certain anatomy um, may or may not cause more of a problem based on how the, nip, the breast tissue it's connected to moves. So you can see the picture uh, with the mom in the red shirt. Um, she has a maybe shorter nipple and yet her breast tissue is very um, stretchy and pliable. And you can see that she's able to make a pretty good breast sandwich there. And you could imagine that a baby's mouth could get on deeply on to the breast and not just onto the nipple and could likely sustain a latch with that shaping um, help there. Compared to the mom on, on the right who has a smooth nipple and the breast tissue also doesn't look super stretchy. It's more kind of compact and firm. You can imagine here that a baby, especially if we were paired with maybe a, a smaller baby or an early term baby or a baby with lower tone, they may have a really hard time pulling that breast tissue into the mouth, not only because the nipple tissue is smoother, but because the breast tissue is more compact. So that's another piece that we have to consider. And then again, it really comes down to what is the baby able to do? Um, so here, this nipple that you can see um, maybe is a little bit on, on the wider side. If you were just to walk in into a patient room and see that nipple, and if this baby is paired with a little low birth, this nipple is paired with a little low birth weight baby, that baby may have a harder time getting deep onto the nipple. However, this nipple is paired with this baby who is nice and robust. Look at those fat pads on his cheeks. So this baby didn't struggle at all. And what was interesting is that this mother was actually told uh, during her pregnancy that she would struggle with breastfeeding because her nipples were too big. Um, so what a bummer that she went into breastfeeding to think that something was wrong with her and that she was going to struggle. Now she had a baby that had no problem getting on to these wider nipples. So one of the first things we can do if we're looking at helping with uh, maybe some anatomical challenges is to improve graspability. Sometimes these things um, happen during the engorgement stage more so because the breast is now full. Um, reverse pressure softening is a great trick if the mom has some edema in her areola. Um, imagine that this mom had a, you know, 24 hour induction and then she ended up with a C-section and here she is on day three or four. And not only are her breasts getting fuller as her milk comes in, but also there's edema. She's swollen from her ankles all the way to her eyeballs. And often that breast tissue really gets swollen too. Sometimes moms are surprised that there's edema there, not just milk. So reverse pressure softening kind of temporarily pushes away that fluid kind of back away from the nipple so that the, the breast tissue is a little bit more graspable. We're just trying to help baby out. So the way moms do that is they kind of lean on back like they would sit to watch a movie, um, just sort of semi reclined comfortable position. Um, and then with her fingers, she puts a little pressure around the areola for a few, you know, a few 30 seconds, a minute, this isn't exact. The idea is just that we're kind of giving some pressure there to push that fluid away. Sometimes when she releases her fingers, you might even see indents in uh, the skin because that is edema. And she might move her hands a little bit clockwise and, and do it again and then feed baby right after. And she may really notice that baby is able to latch and sustain because the tissue was just a little bit more graspable. Softening the breast uh, before the feedings can also help. And my favorite way to do this would be hand expression. Hand expression is one of the best uh, hands-on skills that moms can learn when they are breastfeeding. If a mom knows how to get milk out of her breast, her confidence goes up. 
She, if she worries that, oh my gosh, what am I going to do if my baby won't latch? What am I going to do if the power goes out and my pump stops working? What am I going to do if I forget my pump when, I, when I'm at work? Hand expression is a great, great skill for moms to learn. And this is a perfect time to teach it because uh, her breasts are fuller. Baby's kind of struggling to sustain that latch deeply onto the breast. And so showing her hand expression can not only solve the issue of today, but give her confidence for later. The other option would be to have her pump for a couple minutes. If she's not comfortable with hand expression, maybe pumping for two minutes before um, she feeds may just get a little bit of milk out in order to soften that areola. Um, may also um, evert a nipple as well. Let's look at some of those tools um, that can also be used for nipple aversion. Um, if the nipple is on the smoother side, then some of these things can temporarily pull that nipple out a little bit so baby has a little bit more um, to latch on to. There's lots of different pro products on the market. Um, ones that involved um, syringes with a little bit of, uh, to put a little pressure, the breast shells, which uh, put a little pressure around kind of the base of the nipple to kind of stretch some of those adhesions on the inside gently so that moms um, find that over time they're nipples a little bit longer. Um, some things that use a little bit of suction, like the, the um, kind of bicycle horn one. Now, not like the old school bicycle horn pump that was really, really damaging. This one is, is very much more gentle and, and can avert just a little bit of um, pressure there so that we can um, make the nipple just a bit longer for a couple seconds. This is something that the mom does right before she latches baby on to help improve graspability. Again, wish we were all in this room because I think we'd all get a chuckle out of um, the picture on the right, which is the old sawed off um, syringe that can be used as a nipple averter too. I'm sure we would get a lot of nodding heads to say who has made this tool. Luckily, we have some now that don't involve um, a giant knife that we used to keep in the clinic um, to be able to create this. We have some better ones now. Okay. So if you have ever heard one of my talks before, you will know that I am all about positioning. This, um, you know, we can go back to basics in every single situation, no matter what, good pos positioning can help. And uh, in the reasons for using or you not using a nipple shield, it's the exact same thing. When we get a mom and baby into excellent positioning, her confidence goes up because the baby is exhibiting those newborn reflexes um, for feeding. The baby's more likely to have a great latch, whether there's a nipple shield there or not. And to me, my kind of tenets of latch and positioning is that movie watching position. I love that because semi reclined, that's a great word for literature, but does it really get what we want moms to do? We want them to scoot down, right? And get a little bit more comfy. And when we think, so I say, okay, you're going to sit down to watch a really long movie. How are you going to sit? Whoop, moms go right into an optimal position. Um, we want to get her comfortable. If she's in hospital bed, we're going to put a pillow under her knees. If she's on a, in a chair, if we have the ability to give her a stool, otherwise she might just cross her legs. Um, and then we want baby tucked in close. You can actually see there right by that T for tucked. We can see that baby's bum is almost under the opposite breast. This is a huge trick. If babies get tucked in really close under the opposite breast, or if they were in, um, you know, under the arm position, they're bum is really, really close to mom's body. If they were in sideline position, baby's tummy is right up against mom's tummy. The idea is that they're tucked in really, really close. What that does is it brings their chin deep into the breast. And it's when their chin touches the breast, I always tell parents, there's a button on your baby's chin. And when the baby's chin feels the breast, they go, oh, and they open up into this sniffing position. Now, if you can imagine if there's a smoother nipple or maybe a baby with a recessed chin, you know, significantly recessed chin, all of these positioning things help to be the best possible latch um, that we can get. And so that chin to breast is a really, really helpful trick um, in order to get babies to open wide. That's sometimes a big question, right? Parents will say, how do I get my baby to open wide? Start with reclined position tuck the bum to get the chin to the breast. I always joke, this is why I have a job because who would ever know that, right? Who would ever know that where baby's bum is makes a difference when it comes to latch and positioning, but it really does. 
And then, of course, our wonderful standard of skin to skin. Uh, that can really help baby elicit those best um, newborn reflexes, like baby going into that s s sniffing position, relaxing their hands. You can really see that here in these pictures. When this baby's chin touches, they do this little sniffing position. If you're ever seeing a baby go like this, head down, hands up, shaking their head, kind of tucking, that's a really tough position to latch in. Step back, mom recline, tuck the bum, and see if babies, when baby's chin touches the breast, they don't change to that lovely um, sniffing position. So the next thing we want to think about if we're um, considering a nipple shield is what um, is baby's oral assessment? And if this is in your scope, in your practice, then doing a good oral assessment to see what you find. Is there, um, how does the baby's tongue or suck feel? Is it rhythmic? Um, does it undulate? Is it, um, is it, do you feel strength there? Is baby constantly smacking, losing the latch on your finger? Of course, with a glove, unlike this picture, which I assume is the mother. <laughs> um, and then, or are you feeling more piston-like sucking? Are you feeling a high palate? Um, is there restriction? Are we seeing that baby doesn't have good extension or the inability to elevate their tongue in the back of their mouth? What type of things are we are we seeing? And then based on your own scope, um, you would make recommendations. My role as a RN IBCLC means that I don't diagnose a tongue tie, um, but I would give the parent the information of what I'm feeling in my assessment and then be able to recommend that they talk to an appropriate provider. But remember, if you then say, okay, this baby I'm thinking has a really high palate, I'm worried about some tongue restriction, they've got an appointment to see their pediatrician tomorrow to discuss possible tongue tie. Um, but, you know, I introduce a nipple shield because that helps baby sustain the latch, or maybe it helps um, protect mom's milk supply until we can, you know, walk further down the road of the true issue. But in that case, is the baby moving milk? If we got it more comfortable for mom, is the baby transferring? So this might be an appropriate time when we have to in introduce more tools, like the, the mom may introduce pumping and we may give the baby um, her pumped milk or another supplementation if the baby isn't transferring milk. So, so we really wanna think about the whole picture there. And then we want to think about the treatment of sore nipples. If we're introducing a nipple shield as a barrier in order to help mom's nipples heal up, what can we do to really make sure, again, we're addressing the underlying cause? Um, we, again, back to basics, good latch every single time, even with the nipple shield, especially, and um, that we can try doing expressed milk after feedings. Again, a great opportunity to teach that important skill of hand expression. And then if there's tissue breakdown, if we're seeing scabs or cracking or some um, wound, nipple wounds there, then we might go to some of our non-pharmacological comfort measures such as hydrogel dressings or meta honey um, or what you know, things you recommend in your practice. But it's important to really focus on healing her nipples as well if we're using a nipple shield as a barrier. Okay, so we covered our first step of the nipple shield game plan by really addressing some of the underlying reasons of why we might be introducing a nipple shield. Now let's look at some of the nipple shield pitfalls. So really what this is about is kind of staying away from the always and never. I chuckle when I think I try always to never say always and never say never because um, what, you know, there will always be that situation there again, always there will be that situation where you're sometimes surprised. Um, so some of the ones that I think are common around nipple shields are moms with inverted nipples. They need a nipple shield. Again, I've had moms who had providers previously tell them or maybe friends or family members, oh, you have an inverted nipple, you will need a nipple shield. Well, again, not always. Sometimes when there's an inverted nipple, again, we have to look at what is the breast connect, what is the tissue of the breast it's connected to. With this mom, sure, her nipple is inverted, but look at how stretchy her breast tissue is. 
this, I happen to know that this baby went on to breastfeed for a year, never knew, used a nipple shield. Mom had no idea that breastfeeding with an inverted nipple might cause challenges. Um, so again, it's based on the breast tissue. It's based on the baby it's paired with um, all of those things. So just because we see something doesn't necessarily mean that we will need to use a tool for the job. Um, another common one that I sometimes hear around nipple shields is that the preterm baby or the small babies, they always need a nipple shield. Um, and so, again, we have to think about, well, is that really true? Um, do we need a, a nipple shield for every baby that is small or born preterm? You know, our Paula Meyer is a wonderful researcher that specifically researches around preterm infants. And her research has shown that nipple shields can be very effective for helping uh, preterm babies who are not transferring milk well. So if that initial latch attempt, baby's not sustaining the latch or they're on, but they're not transferring the milk we know is there, um, then a nipple shield may be a very effective tool. But Paula Meyer also really lays out that a nipple shield isn't indicated for all preterm infants because some preterm infants will breastfeed effectively. So again, it's a tool in our tool ba basket we may put, pull it out more likely um, in the NICU compared to in your mother baby units, um, but it's not a requirement that all preterm babies or small or lower birth weight, we could sub in a lot of words there, need to use a nipple shield. And then we always want to avoid always and never. Um, I, again, nipple shields can be such a flashpoint, which is interesting to me. It's just a tool in our toolbox. It can work great in certain situations. So we need to be careful of some of these things that we uh, of our language around this. I have absolutely heard some nurses say, I have no problem going to a nipple shield. I love nipple shields. I don't, you know, it makes the latch so much easier. Well, really? Wouldn't the latch and positioning and education all still be exactly the same, whether you're using a nipple shield or not? Um, in fact, what the way I think about it is that a nipple shield really is, is indicating that there's a challenge, that there is a problem that we're trying to help fix. So really it increases our level of acuity um, for lactation. At our hospital, we really do use a lactation acuity system to help us triage as lactation on the maternity unit, which patients we need to see. And nip, um, families using a nipple shield are going to be higher on our lactation acuity uh, you know, list because that indicates to me that we introduced a tool, something was going on. So really it requires more assessment and more education. Uh, the flip side of that is I've heard um, nurses say, well, I would never use a nipple shield. Nipple shield shows that you're not doing a good job and you should never use a nipple shield. Well, no, I disagree. Sometimes a nipple shield is even um, helpful in the moment. For example, what if um, after delivery, this mom had a long labor, she just had a cesarean, it's midnight, she comes back to the room and she's laying flat on her back because she's super nauseous from the, the anesthesia. And so she is flat on her back and her breast is very kind of flat out and um, baby's trying, we're helping with the latch and baby's trying to latch on and baby's just not able to help with that um, latch. Well, positioning is a challenge then, then because mom really has to be flat to avoid her, um, you know, to help with her nausea. And so in that scenario, we may pull out a nipple shield to get that um, feeding successful for that mom. However, the next morning, the mom's feeling so much better. She's able to sit up, able to do more breast shaping and support. That baby may not need a nipple shield ever again. That nurse who introduced it at that feeding wasn't a bad nurse. It was situational in that time. And so we can talk each other up that way to say, oh, yeah, sometimes, you know, let's try without a nipple shield this time. Sometimes babies, as they get older, even hours older, can change their ability to suck and sustain the latch. So let's try it. Um, that really helps um, us avoid some of those common pitfalls when it comes to um, nipple shields. Okay, so we covered that one too. Let's move on to some of our nipple shield education and our plans um, for follow up. As you notice, I always try to be very careful with the words that we use when it comes to describing uh, mother's anatomy, when it comes to describing um, that their the breastfeeding experience. Mothers are in a state of hyper awareness 
And so they will remember things, they will internalize things and think on things um, more so than any other time. I think it's probably true for a lot of us that are parents have vivid memories of what happened in the couple days or even a couple weeks after your baby was born, particularly when opinions come from a person with authority. And the lactation team is seen as the experts in breastfeeding. And so if we use words, that have a potential negative connotation, it can really stick with moms. Every opportunity I have to normalize and to tell moms that the equipment that they came with is wonderful and perfect, that's awesome. Um, even if we're introducing a tool, how much can we normalize? You'll notice that I have um, decided after many, uh, a lot of thought and kind of asking around of, I don't love the word flat nipples. Flat can have a negative connotation. Flat affect, um, you know, flat just doesn't doesn't sound as as um, normal and supportive. So I've changed to my vernacular now to use the word smooth, smooth skin. Smooth just sounds, I don't know. It, it sounds better to me. So it and, you know, you have to make the decision of what words um, you find are the most get the, the best reaction from your parents. Um, but I think it's really important um, that we are choosing words that communicate um, confidence to, to parents. So let's talk a little bit about nipple shield types and sizes. Um, so here is some different examples of nipple shields that are currently out there on the market. Um, they sometimes have different um, shapes with how the that contact or cutout is. Um, standardly in our unit for um, in the mother baby unit, we stock 24 millimeter standard nipple shields. Um, it certainly may be appropriate for smaller size, maybe 20 millimeter, maybe even 16 millimeter for those true teeny tiny low birth weight or very preterm infants um, that may be appropriate. But in general, even for a uh, late term, even for um, a early term, sorry, um, or a small baby on our mother baby units, we're going to generally start with the 24 millimeter. I wanted to throw this nipple shield in here because I, I, again, I wish we were all in the same room so we could have a little discussion around this nipple shield. This nipple shield is relatively new on the market. And the first time I saw it, my jaw dropped because I thought, oh my gosh, this looks so much thicker like the old school nipple shields. It looks so much shaped like a bottle nipple. How would this work? So I've asked around, I haven't seen it too much in my own practice, but I have asked around and what I found is that, yep, lots of lactation consultants share the same concerns. Um, but one interesting thing I did hear was that some uh, a couple lactation nurses who have uh, see babies uh, farther out um, will thought that it would be a good one if a baby was transitioning from a bottle um, and had a strong bottle preference to transitioning back to the breast. Um, certainly, you could imagine why that might be a good use um, for this shape because it would be very familiar to a bottle nipple shape. Um, I would really want to keep an eye on um, transfer latch and do a really good assessment of feeding. Um, but, you know, that's a perfect example of wow, my initial instinct was, ooh, and, um, but there could be a really appropriate um, uh, situation for this tool. So it's important that we teach uh, mothers how to apply the nipple shield. Uh, how often have you seen a mom pick up a nipple shield and place it on her nipple like a hat and the baby's getting on and the baby's flailing and the nipple shield's falling off and she's getting teary and, oh man, um, nipple shield ap proper application can really help avoid some of that. So doing a little hand expression, again, perfect opportunity to pepper in some of that um, anticipatory guidance and help in the moment um, to uh, hand express a little drop, put on a uh, that drop on the outside of the nipple shield. Again, that smell can help baby elicit some of those newborn reflexes. And then we kind of turn the nipple shield a little bit inside out on itself. This picture shows it beautifully. Um, and if she were to, this, this person were to let go, the nipple shield will probably stay in that um, in that shape. And that's a great way to then be able to then almost kind of pop it on so that it, um, it pops on and pulls a little breast tissue inside the nipple shield. That way babies um, compressing breast tissue, not just um, on the plastic itself. So the cutout, again, great opportunity to explain why that's there, but it can go where the baby's nose is. Again, parents are often really worried about that. Um, so positioning it to kind of however the baby will be positioned can sometimes help. 
So I have a little video here showing that and there's no sound, although there is some background noise. So just don't worry about that, but I'll keep talking. So here this mother does some hand expression. She's got a nice little drop of milk there, puts it on the outside of the nipple shield, pulls the nipple shield out on, on inside out almost, and then kind of folds it back and wiggles it a bit. So it pulls in breast tissue. There's a little bit of wrinkling at the base there. And what can happen then is that she can take her hand away. Hopefully that nipple shield is going to stay so that she can focus on getting in good positioning. So um, what about latch education? What changes um, when we introduce a nipple shield? Well, trick question, absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing changes when we introduce a nipple shield um, for how we teach latch and positioning. And again, this kind of speaks to that, well, nipple shields make it easier. Well, maybe it makes the baby sustain the latch better, um, but our positioning and our education and all of that is exactly the same. Uh, getting the baby deep, uh, chin deep into the breast can really help baby sustain a deep latch, whether the shield is, th is there or not. We also want to really take a look to make sure the baby isn't kind of coming off and on um, the nipple shield. So you can see if this baby was latched on right here, they would be compressing the tip of the nipple, potentially causing some pain for mom, even with the shield there, and um, not latching as deeply. We really want to see that the baby's cheeks and chin are still making really good contact with the breast. This is a great um, picture of that. This baby, if we were to be able to peek down in there, we would probably see the chin indenting mother's breast tissue. Baby's cheeks are, are at the, the breast, the nose is skimming the breast. And remember, we're, when we are introducing a shield or any lactation tool, it indicates that we were doing that for a reason. There was a, there was a challenge, and so we have to give more assessment and education. So when we are looking at, um, at the feeding, we wanna make sure that we have the three S's going on, that we do see baby sucking. Do we see active sucking? Do we see that nutritive sucking? Do we, or are we seeing those little flutter non-nutritive sucks? Are we starting to hear swallows, those audible swallows that we indicate milk transfer? Are, is the mom feeling softening in her breast from before to after? It may not feel empty if she's in the engorgement phase, but it should feel softer. And if one of these pieces is not there, one of our best tools is breast compression. So if the baby gets, yes, we got a latch with a nipple shield, awesome, the baby had been struggling before, but now the baby's just kind of hanging out and barely sucking, breast compression. Breast compression and massage can really help move that milk to get baby into the active feeding. And then our education. Um, again, I... I think it's very important that we discuss and, and chart in our chart and explain to um, parents why we're using a nipple shield. Um, potentially we're using a nipple shield because mom has smoother nipples. So we're using it as a nipple elongator. Maybe we're using the nipple shield because baby um, has maybe had a vacuum extraction and baby has a very tight jaw and wasn't able to latch deeply. So the nipple shield helped baby um, get on the breast. Um, so I think for parents to understand why and to let them know what we think about the, the length of time. I often, I will always say nipple shields are meant to be a bridge and most moms are able to wean from a nipple shield by far. Um, so letting families know that this is a temporary tool. And we also want to make sure that they know how to put it on our application process, how to clean it, um, warm soapy water, air dry. We want to explain nipple shield weaning and how we do that and who to contact. So this is a little example of the handout that we have in our clinic. Um, the idea being that they have something to refer to and know how to contact us if they have questions. So let's talk a little bit about nipple shield weaning. Um, when mothers are ready to wean from a nipple shield, we want to help give them some guidelines of how to do that. Sometimes if a mom if a mom was initiated a nipple shield in those first few days, sometimes she's like ready to wean from it when her milk comes in. Sometimes that can be the hardest moment to wean from it because the breast is at its fullest. And remember that graspability piece. So, so um, we can try, but sometimes uh, moms find that they have more success if they wait until after that breast engorgement phase. 
I feel like, and I don't have a good research study on this, but I certainly feel like in my um, long practice that most moms are able to wean from a nipple shield by around three to six weeks. 100%. There are those ones that are on it longer or needing more hands on help weaning from it, but that's pretty typical, at least in my practice. So one of the um, tricks that I use to help moms, um, to help educate moms on how to wean from a nipple shield when they're ready is called the nipple shield waltz. So what we do is we latch the baby on just like normal, wait until the baby is uh, sucking happily and moving milk, um, you know, a few minutes into the feeding. Um, and then we will um, get the, break the suction with your finger. So a little pop, of the of the suction there you often hear a kind of a sound and then take the shield off i'll just say just set it on your shoulder we're not take, taking it far we're just setting it over here and then attempt to relatch baby you may find that um, because the milk is right there because baby had just elicited a letdown because the nipple is maybe a little bit more elongated because the nip baby had just been sucking on the nipple inside the shield, that baby is able to, to relatch and finish the feed without the shield. Whereas if we had started it at the beginning without all of those things, that sometimes baby might struggle initiating the feed without the shield. Um, the, and so you can give that a try, that nipple shield waltz uh, mid feeding. I call it the waltz because you do those three steps pretty quickly. Latch the baby, break the suction, shield off, relatch. You do those steps pretty quickly in order to kind of not, we're not going to go put the shield down and then change a bunch of things and then try to latch the baby on. That may not help that, those kind of things we're after of the milk right there and the nipple at the most longest. Um, and so we can play around with this. Um, the key though is that nipple shield weaning should not be frustrating and it should not initiate pain. If when baby latches, mom's feeling pain, then stop, put that shield back on and see her for a, for a, a visit or do an assessment. Um, if she's really frustrated, the baby doesn't relax or the baby gets screaming mad or anything like that, then we would want to say, okay, stop, put the shield back on and let's give it either a little bit more time or, um, or try again at a different um, day or with help. So, Sometimes what is surprising to moms is that babies don't often wean from a nipple shield like boom, they're done. What it sometimes how it often goes is that they will latch without it mid feeding, maybe even that first time and moms are like, yes, that was great. And then the next four times they try, they don't do it at all. Moms are like, why? What changed? Babies just aren't super consistent yet. They're just new, they're just learning. And so any, we're building on successes over the course of maybe a week, not necessarily that every single one um, gets better than the next. And so um, it, it's important that moms know that so they, they don't feel like they're failing if nipple shield weaning takes a little bit, that's normal. Okay, and when we think about follow up, um, I think it's really important that within our practice, if we're the ones initiating a nipple shield, what is our plan for a follow up? Um, how are we going to make sure that this uh, mom and baby feels supported with using a nipple shield or really with any tool that we introduced? Um, in, uh, in our clinic, we put mothers down for a phone call in that first week called the nipple shield follow up call um, to just check in. How are feedings going? Um, the, the timing of that is kind of dependent on why we introduced a shield. For example, if we introduced a shield because she had damaged nipples, um, I want that call to be on the sooner end, within a few days maybe, if we have the luxury of doing that, um, because I wanna make sure that the tool, the tool I introduced is working. The nipple shield is acting as a barrier, her nipples are healing. She might not quite be ready to wean from it yet, but at least we're making sure that um, is the reason. Compared to if she has maybe those really fibrous breast tissue and inverted nipples where I feel like mm, this baby's going to have to get quite a bit bigger, nice fat pads on its cheeks and, and a well-established milk supply, it might be a couple weeks um, or even maybe a month that we are checking in kind of saying, okay, now let's try to work on weaning. Sometimes babies do need nipple shields long-term. There are absolutely those cases and it can work. Some moms look back on that experience of using nipple shield for months and months 
and had no um, problems. We want to make sure that that's where she's at with the, the use of this tool, um, but we might want to consider additional weight checks. I know certainly in some of our pediatric groups around, if nipple shields are being used past the first month, they like to have that baby weighed just for a quick drop in weight check um, monthly in order to make sure that baby's continuing to gain and that's an also a reflection of mom's milk supply over time. So that can be a consideration as well. All right, so we covered all of our game plan. Um, and uh, I to sum up before we get on to uh, questions, um, we want to really use nipple shields or any lactation tool support to support mothers. We want to first up make sure that the nipple shield is the right tool for the job. So what is the real reason we're using the shield and does it make sense for this situation? And always, no matter what, whether we're using a shield or not, we are using excellent latch and positioning techniques. And we want to make sure, because the one thing that's consistent from our nipple shield research is that um, we want to make sure we have good follow up and support from others who are using nipple shields, because our goal through all of this is confident families. And the bibliography I used is included in um, the uh, slides. And thank you so much. Thank you for listening. I think um, we'll have some time, a few minutes at least, for questions. Thank you, Donnie Ann, for that information. Um, if you can, uh, there you go, advance your slide that. Um, we do have a few minutes, about five for questions and answers, and we do have some that have started coming to the chat function. Please submit them there. Um, the first question that came through is, how do you size the nipple shield to mom and baby? Oh, good question. Um, again, in, in my practice dealing with mother babies, so not so much dealing with the very preterm infants, uh, early term of babies for sure, um, I start with a 24 millimeter. If baby is not able to latch deeply, so if that nipple shield is gagging them, sometimes even a good sized baby um, will have a strong gag reflex potentially. And so I would potentially go down to a 20 millimeter. However, what I find is if you're trying to, again, get that baby to open wide and latch on deeply, if we have a narrower nipple shield, um, then sometimes that's encouraging some of these little kissy lips and getting baby um, on with a very narrow latch. So that la positioning is very important. Sometimes um, I have had those cases where moms have very large nipples and although a nipple shield may help baby get on deeply, are we really getting on to breast tissue? Those ones can be challenging and sometimes it's a, a tincture of time to let baby really grow into mom's nipples. Okay, thank you for that answer. The next question is someone asking what the name of that bottle shaped nipple shield was. It was a Haka. Sorry if I didn't say that. Yeah, it's a hawk okay. and a bull shield. And I, I, I think there's some other ones around. Again, I wish we could all be like, have you seen them before? Um, because I think there are some other ones around that are shaped like that, but that particular one was a haka. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, what is happening when the edges of the shield, usually by the baby's chin, is deeply cre creasing? Sorry, deeply creasing? Creasing, yes. Um, so I'm wondering if what you mean is like, okay, the baby's latched on and we're seeing some of that outside of the shield there. And if baby, like I talked about is deep into the breast, is their chin being there causing the nipple shield to, to pop off? I'm thinking that's kind of what, what you're asking. And no, I really haven't um, seen that. Good positioning, first of all, getting the nipple shield kind of popped on, like we talked about, can really help it pre prevent from falling off and becoming this, this issue every, where it's falling and mothers are getting frustrated. Um, and so good uh, application is important. But when baby is in that sniffing position and their chin is indenting the breast, that that's really encouraging a deep latch and um, ends up with the nipple shield and nipple more to the roof of baby's mouth, which gives that tactile stimulation right before that junction of the hard and soft palate where baby needs to to feel that nipple shield in order to know to maintain sucking and swallowing. OK, thank you for that. Um, someone is asking if you're able to share the handout that you use at your hospital for patients. Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, hmm, could I get back to you, Kim, on that? 
That's fine. And if you're able to, um, maybe your facility uh, wouldn't allow that. But if you're able to, I will definitely go ahead and make sure that gets out to everyone. Um, okay. That's yeah, on the call. I, I wrote that handout, but I would just need to ask um, the management team at Evergreen if that's something that we would be willing to share. Um, so I'll look into it. Sure. Thank you. And again, I'll let everyone know if that's possible. Um, the next question that came through is what does the measurement of 21 millimeters reflect? Is that the length or the width of the nipple? Oh my gosh, good question. I don't know. I, you, you stumped me. I wish we could come off mute. I bet that there is somebody on here that knows and I'm gonna go research that answer. I actually, um, being the previous product trainer of Medela customer service, um, the 21 or 24 millimeter reflects the width of the opening of the shield, much so like the brush the, shields. Got it. At the okay, at like like the um, flanges. Excellent. Correct. Well, great. Yep. I love this. I learned something <laughs> new today too. I'm glad I could answer that question. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, it looks like we're almost at the top of the hour again. Um, Donnie Ann, thank you so much for this information. Um, it was great. And uh, just a couple things before we end. Um, registration is open for our July 29th webinar, our August 19th webinar, and the September 15th webinar. And registration is, like I said, at the top of the hour, open for uh, Medela's global annual symposium um, for more information you can uh, go to medelaeducation.com and click on the banner that'll bring you to the registration and information page and for any researchers or clinicians that are interested in submitting a poster abstract the deadline to get those in is july 31st so it's coming up quick a couple other quick things for the symposium. Um, the price is 60 euros, which calculates to about $70 US. Um, the credits that will be available is 6.25 nursing contact hours for attendees here in the States and 6.25 CL hours for our Canadian attendees. And the registration, there is an opportunity. The registration can be donated to help uh, give us more supplies um, to be used at the Ronald McDonald Charities. So when you're at the registration portion where you're paying, you can click um, that you'd like your registration to be donated as um, to be used for more supplies for the Ronald McDonald House Charities. Um, if anyone has any questions about registration for that symposium, they can certainly email education at medela.com. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us today and have a great afternoon. Thank you.